Starting off at number 10, the first similarity is Abraham. Abraham is an important figure in Islam and Judaism, and these religions are both known as Abrahamic religions. Muslims descended from the prophet Abraham and his son Ishmael, and Abraham and his son Isaac are where the Jewish nation descended from. Islam as an organized religion was founded by the prophet Muhammad in the 7th century AD, and Islam was born in Arabia. Both Jews and Arabs are classified as Semitic people, and traditionally viewed as descendants from Shem, who was the son of Noah. These religions are also monotheistic. They share the common belief in the oneness of God, which is monotheism, and Muslims refer to God by the name Allah. The root of the word Allah, El, is found throughout the Jewish Torah as a name of God as well. And they believe in the existence of one God and only one God, period. So you won't be finding any beliefs like the Trinity or depictions of God in the form of avatars or anything like that in both of these religions. The next thing that they share in common is that they reject the Christian view of Jesus. The Christian faith claims that Jesus Christ is God, but both Jews and Muslims fully reject this claim about Jesus. Other Christian beliefs about Jesus that they they reject are also the resurrection of Jesus, Jesus being the literal Son of God, and also Him being the Savior of the world. Christianity maintains that Jesus is in some sense a divine incarnation of God who is the second person of the Trinity consisting of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and hence equal with God. But in Judaism and Islam, each of them see this as a very radical and nonsensical claim because you simply can't be incarnated into a human being if you're God. God just doesn't operate like that. So from the perspective of both Judaism and Islam, such beliefs about Jesus are seen as anti-monotheistic. Islam and Judaism also share a common belief in the resurrection and the judgment day. So most Jews and Muslims believe in some version of of this, the general accepted idea is that there will come a day when God will collectively raise from the dead every single person who has ever lived and then individually pronounce judgment. All who are deemed righteous in God's eyes, they're given a reward and for those who aren't, they're given a punishment. Now of course there are different variations in the understanding and the specific sequence of the resurrection and the judgment, but the core idea is shared in some form between these two religions and it plays a very important role in the two faiths. Jews and Muslims also believe in angels. Judaism and Islam each teach of heavenly beings generally referred to as angels, and angels are supernatural beings created by God to serve as his messengers and to act out all instructions given to them by God. Both the Tanakh, which is the full Hebrew Bible, and the Talmud, which is the supporting literature, have numerous accounts of stories about angels. Likewise, in the Quran, it talks about angels being God's messengers as well, and the Quran was revealed to the prophet Muhammad by the angel Gabriel, and both Judaism and Islam also warn against worshipping any angels. The next similarity is prophets and divine intervention. So Judaism and Islam teach that God communicates directly to humans through prophets or human beings chosen by God through dreams and visions. In Judaism, Moses is often seen as the main prophet since it was through him that God revealed the Torah. The first five books of the Bible are collectively referred to as the Torah if you didn't know, and the second or the middle section of the Hebrew Bible is known as the Nevi'im, meaning the prophets, and it contains accounts of subsequent prophets after Moses. For Islam, Muhammad is the prophet through which God revealed the Quran, and the prophet Muhammad is regarded by Muslims as the last prophet through whom God will speak to humanity. Just like the Jewish scriptures, the Quran recognizes Adam, Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, King Solomon, King David, Elijah, as well as many other prophets. There's also quite a lot of similarities with their diet rules. So most people have heard the term kosher in reference to Jews and that Jews only eat kosher foods. Pork, for example, is not eaten because it's not kosher. Similarly, Muslims are also required to eat only certain kinds of food known as halal foods and to avoid certain other kinds of foods called haram foods. 
The term kosher means ritually correct, and this is derived from the Torah. Of course, not all Jews strictly follow these dietary laws. Most Orthodox Jews do, however, eat kosher, whereas many Reformed Jews may be a little bit more lenient in the degree to which they stick to these rules. In Islam, the Quran forbids eating pork, eating food with blood in it, improperly slaughtered animals, and a number of other types of food would be considered haram in Islam. There are some variations in which foods and drinks are allowed in either of these faiths though. So we're coming down to the final three similarities between these two religions. And the third one is prayer. So anyone may pray as often and at any time that they want, but in both Judaism and Islam, they share the similarity of a fixed number of set prayers per day. Generally, Muslims have five formal prayers a day as part of the five pillars of Islam, and Muslims worldwide are required to face the direction of Mecca in Saudi Arabia when conducting these prayers. In Judaism, usually prayers are done three times a day, one in the morning, then in the afternoon, and finally in the evening. And sometimes more prayers are added for holy days. Certain branches of Judaism consider daily prayers optional though. They also both see Jerusalem as a holy city. According to the Bible, the capital of Israel today and one of the world's oldest cities, Jerusalem, was originally established by King David about 3,000 years ago. David's son, King Solomon, established the first temple there. And even though the temple was never rebuilt after the destruction in 70 AD, Jerusalem is still held in high regard in Judaism. The Temple Mount with the Wailing Wall sees thousands of visitors who come there and visit for prayer. For Muslims, Jerusalem is also a holy place. It's Islam's third holiest city after Mecca and Medina, and Islam recognizes the previous prophets throughout the history and their connection to Jerusalem as well. Jerusalem also plays a role in the Prophet Muhammad's night journey and ascension, where the angel Gabriel transported the Prophet Muhammad from Mecca to Jerusalem for prayer, and then from Jerusalem to heaven, where he met some of the previous prophets who ascended. Jerusalem was also the direction that Muslims were instructed to face during their prayers, and of course this was changed to Mecca once the Muslims were divinely instructed to do so. And the final similarity I want to look at is peace. Peace is a very central concept in both of these religions. They both have a similar greeting, meaning peace be upon you. There's Shalom Alekem, and that's the Hebrew greeting used in Judaism. And the appropriate response would be Alekem Shalom. And this literally translates to unto you peace. Salam alaikum is the Arabic greeting and that's used in Islam and the appropriate response would be wa alaikum salam meaning the same thing as a Hebrew response unto you peace. We have the calendar. One of the most interesting similarities between Judaism and Islam is the calendar. In both Islam and Judaism, the calendar is based on the cycles of the moon. The month begins by the sighting of the moon or calculating when the new moon will be in the sky. The start of the year is called Rosh Hashanah in Judaism, which in Arabic is called Ras Asana. Then there's Yom Kippur, which corresponds to Ashura in Islam. Following that, there's a famous Jewish holiday, Passover, which corresponds to the Muslim Laylat al Barat in the month of Sheban. Serifat Ha Omar in Judaism corresponds to Ramadan in Islam. And Shavuot lines up with Eid al Fatir. And the 9th of Av happens during the time of the Muslim Hajj. So it's pretty surprising that practically all the major holidays and events in Judaism and Islam correspond. Next up is circumcision. Now, this was one I was going to put into part one, but I didn't know if YouTube was gonna flag my video like literally I've been flagged for saying the word God which is crazy but this time around I'm like you know I can't really hold back on the facts so here it is right so both Islam and Judaism they practice male circumcision in the Bible Abraham was commanded to be circumcised and this would become a symbol of the promise that God made to Abraham as well as his offspring what we promote in Islam is male circumcision because this is uh, regarded not only as the sunnah or practice of our Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him but a practice that goes back all the way to the Prophet Abraham and has been practiced by many prophets since. So of course the practice continued with Abraham's children. The Torah lays out the instructions that says that newborns should be circumcised on the eighth day after birth. Now science has shown that the eighth day is very important. Why? Because the levels of vitamin K are the highest on that day and vitamin K plays an important role in stopping 
bleeding. The command for circumcision isn't in the Quran however, but the Prophet Muhammad required it for his male followers, which makes sense because Jews and Muslims have pretty much the same history. We should avoid uh, female circumcision altogether, but male circumcision, this is not known to be harmful. I, I'm not aware of any study which shows that this is harmful. Jesus himself is said to have been circumcised. At number eight, we have female head covering. Both Islam and Judaism encourage modesty in your parents and also promote that women should cover their hair. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole ins and outs of why women's heads have to be covered, but I just want to point out that the similarity exists. The general belief of when and why women should cover their hair does have some differences though in both the religions. Many married Jewish women wear a headscarf to cover their hair. Islam instructs that women wear a headscarf or hijab after puberty. Along with the head covering though, both religions encourage women to dress modestly in general. This includes wearing long and loose fitting clothing. You know, don't want to be showing all your female body parts imprinted out. There is no source that states directly, in black and white, that a married woman must cover her head. We see it indirectly in the scriptures. Let's move on. We have the Hadith and the Talmud up next at number 7. The Islamic Hadith and the Jewish Talmud have also been compared because they are both authoritative texts that are outside of the actual scriptures. The Hadith and the Talmud texts were originally passed down through oral tradition for generations before being put in writing. We're taking a look at religious law at number 6. Judaism and Islam are unique in having their own systems of religious law, which is also based on oral tradition. Oftentimes these laws can override the written laws and also there's no real distinction of them being religious laws only. These laws are often seen as laws period, not bound by religious affiliation. In Islam, the laws are called Sharia and in Judaism, they're known as Halakha. Both Judaism and Islam consider learning and studying religious law to be a form of worship to God. Now in at number five, the halfway spot, we have the similarities in the belief in the tailbone. Yeah, I know, right? Like what am I talking about anyway? So let me get into that. So there's this small bone in the body at the base of the spinal column called the Luz bone, known to some as the coccyx or the cervical vertebra. It's believed that from this bone, the body will be rebuilt at the time of resurrection. Muslims and Jews share the belief that this bone does not decay. Okay. Muslims refer to this bone as Abju al Thanab. Jews believe that people will be resurrected from what they call the Luz in the backbone. Yeah, no, pretty interesting similarity. And number four, we have homosexuality. So this is another touchy topic that people get super worked up about. So I'll do my best to be as sensitive as possible to people of all beliefs. The sacred texts of both Islam and Judaism ban homosexuality and label it as a sin. Now, this has been a much debated point, especially over the past century. Um, the most liberal orthodox positions on this are that gay sex is itself a sin, but, the, but we're all sinners. And so a person who engages in that is still a Jew and still is welcome within the community. Depending on who you speak to, homosexuality is viewed as morally wrong or it's viewed simply as being not as beneficial to humanity as heterosexual relationships which allow for procreation. Not only that, any form of sexual relations outside of marriage is also forbidden in Judaism and Islam. What is forbidden in our religion is the action of intimacy outside of marriage. What is not forbidden, the Sharia does not forbid feelings of the heart. Number three brings us the universal religion. So the next similarity for the most part is going to be quoted because I think it's said pretty well anyways. So the Jewish rabbi Ben Abrahamson, he says, Judaism believes that there is a basic religion which the whole world must follow. In the Quran, it says there is only one religion which is acceptable before Allah, which is Islam. We believe that there is one faith that's required by all mankind and we call it the faith of Noah. This is similar to what is written in the Surah Ashura, and it says that he has laid down the same religion for you as he enjoined on Noah, that which we have revealed to you and which we enjoined to Abraham, Moses, and Jesus. Establish a religion and do not make divisions in it. You can also find this similar idea in Judaism that there is one religion that was given to Adam. It involved monotheism and it involves 
basically seven of the Ten Commandments. They had to believe in reward and punishment. You had to also believe in the last day. You had to believe in the prophets of God. And this is a religion that is required of all mankind. It's required of Jews and non-Jews. Now the second last similarity is the sects and branches. Although they both call for one religion, various sects and branches exist inside of Judaism and Islam. The most popular division in Islam are Sunni, then there's Shia Muslims, and then there's the Karajites. There are also three traditional types of schools in Islam. There's the schools of jurisprudence, the Sufi orders, and the schools of theology. In Judaism, denominations or branches include different groups which have developed among the Jews from ancient times. The main branches today are Orthodox, Conservative, Reform, and Reconstructionist. Of course, several other smaller branches exist as well. And the final similarity I got to share in this episode is is Muslims are mentioned in the Old Testament. So this final similarity is also derived from studies of Rabbi Ben Abrahamson. And when asked if Islam was mentioned in the Old Testament of the Bible, he said yes. In Exodus, when Jethro, aka Shoeb, the father-in-law of Moses, went and made an offering, the offering that he had made was called Shlamim. In other words, a perfect or complete offering. And all the followers of Shoeb or Jethro were called Kenites in the Torah, but in the translation of the Torah in Aramaic, they were also called Salamai Muslamim. So we have the word Muslamim there, meaning the children of Jethro, and it meant much more than that because it actually meant that these were God fearers, meaning people who had great reverence for God. And these were people who were not part of the children of Israel, but believed in one God and followed the commandments of God. And that's what a Muslim is, one who submits to following God. Starting at number 10, we have the multiple names of God. In the Torah, you'll find multiple names attributed to God. There's Yahweh, spelled Y-H-W-H. Then there's the name El, Elohim, El Shaddai, which means God Almighty. And now there are many other names in the rest of the Hebrew Bible. These are just some common ones that appear in the Torah. As for the Quran, of course, there is Allah, which is Arabic equivalent to God in English. There's also As-Salam, there's Al-Aziz, Al-Malik, al Khalik and many others. So as you see in both the Torah and the Quran, there's multiple names attributed to God. And in both the Quran and Torah, God doesn't have one specific name. The similarity at number nine is that it's believed that they were revealed to people. And they actually mentioned this. So in the Torah, first up, there are several questions of who wrote the Torah that still come up. But generally, the Torah is attributed to Moses. However, scholars say that only portions of the Torah can be specifically traced to Moses himself. Like there's an example in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 34 verses 1 to 8, Moses dies there. But the general held view is that the five books of the Torah were revealed to Moses and then somebody else probably just finished it all up. I'll actually be mentioning some scriptures later on in this episode that point to specific statements in the Torah that it was Moses that wrote it. But I'll save those for later, so stick around guys, I'll get there soon. As for the Quran, you can find in Surah 47 verses 2 this passage here. And those who believe and do righteous deeds and believe in what has been sent down upon Muhammad, and it is the truth from their Lord, he will remove from them their misdeeds and amend their condition. So as you can see, the Quran mentioned to Prophet Muhammad by name that the words of the Quran were revealed to him. Number eight is the Quran and Torah recount the creation story. The book of Genesis or Bereshit as it's known in the Hebrew language, which means in the beginning, literally opens up with that exact statement. And then from verse one, it continues to tell the whole story of creation that happens within six days. Now in the Quran, you can find in Surah 7 verses 54, it says, indeed, your Lord is Allah who created the heavens and earth in six days and then established himself above the throne. He covers the night with the day, another night chasing it rapidly, and he created the sun, the moon, and the stars subjected by his command. Unquestionably, his is the creation and the command. Blessed is Allah, the Lord of the worlds. Similarity at number seven are the prophecies. According to Jewish tradition, the Torah is 
filled with prophecies of future events. Now, one of the most important ones being the coming of a prophet, who in most traditions is synonymous with the Messiah. You can find that in the book of Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 where it says, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among you, from your fellow Israelites, you must listen to him. Now with the Quran, it's also viewed by Muslims as a prophetic book filled with many different prophecies. One of the prophecies are of a devastating group of people that are gonna be released and cause havoc. You can find this in the Quran Surah 21 verses 97. It says, but when Yajuj and Majuj are let loose and they rush headlong down every hill. By the way, we've made episodes about Yajuj and Majuj and the prophecies in the Quran. So if you haven't seen those, definitely check them out. We go into a lot of detail in those episodes. But moving on to number six, we have, they both recognize the Torah as being given by God. Now the Torah is mentioned in the Quran. It says, Lo, we have revealed the At Torah, wherein is guidance and a light by which the prophets who surrendered under Allah judge the Jews, and the rabbis and the priests judge by such of Allah's scriptures as they were bidden to observe, and thereunto were they witnesses. So fear not mankind, but fear me, and barter not my revelations for a little gain. Whoso judgeth not by that which Allah hath revealed, such are disbelievers. And that's found in Surah 5 verses 44 of the Quran. Now in the Torah, specifically it says in the book of Numbers chapter 9 verses 23, at the Lord's command they encamped and at the Lord's command they set out. They obeyed the Lord's order in accordance with his command through Moses. Also in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 4 verses 45, it says these are the stipulations, decrees, and laws Moses gave them when they came out of Egypt. And by the way, the term Torah uh, it means the teachings. So that's pretty much summed up in Deuteronomy 4 verses 45. Like here's a bunch of different teachings that God revealed through Moses to share to the children of Israel. The similarity at number five is the world is destroyed in both the Quran and the Torah. The Quran has an entire chapter called Nu, and it speaks of the prophet Noah, where he speaks of a great flood that wiped out humanity at one point in history. In Surah 71 of the Quran, specifically in verses 25 to 26, it says this, because of their sins, they were drowned and put into the fire and they found not for themselves besides Allah any helpers. And Noah said, my Lord, do not leave upon the earth from among the disbelievers an inhabitant. Now over in the Torah, the account of the flood is found in the book of Genesis, chapter six to nine. And in chapter seven, verses 23, it specifically says every living thing on the face of the earth was wiped out people and animals and the creatures that moved along the ground and the birds were wiped from the earth only Noah was left and those with him in the ark the waters flooded the earth for a hundred and fifty days another surprising similarity between the Quran and the Torah is that spirit beings are identified in both of them so the cherubim are the most frequently occurring heavenly creatures that are found in the Hebrew Bible. As a matter of fact, that word appears 91 times in the Hebrew Bible. But the first occurrence of the term cherubim is found in the Torah in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 24. And it, and it goes like this. After he drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the Tree of Life. Now, when we look at the Quran, we see that the jinn are mentioned in it. In Surah 72 verses 1, it says, Say, O Muhammad, it has been revealed to me that a group of the jinn listened and said, Indeed, we have heard an amazing Quran. Also, the Quran mentions angels. There's a passage in Surah 13 verses 11 that says, For each one are successive angels before and behind him who protect him by the decree of Allah. Similarity number three is the Quran and Torah identify Israel as special. The children of Israel have a special status and it's mentioned in the Quran, Surah 2 verses 47. It says, O children of Israel, remember my favor that I have bestowed upon you and that I preferred you over the worlds. Now over in the Torah, it says in the book of Deuteronomy chapter 14 verse 2, 
For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. Out of all the peoples on the face of the earth, the Lord has chosen you to be his treasured possessions. Similarity number two also sort of ties into some of the previous similarities, but the Ten Commandments are mentioned in both the Torah and the Quran. In the book of Exodus specifically, you can find the Ten Commandments listed in the Torah in the book of Exodus chapter 20, and it's also repeated in Deuteronomy. Now for the Quran, it doesn't list them out in order like the Torah does specifically, but the elements that make up the Ten Commandments are actually found throughout the Quran. You'll find literally almost exactly word for word the Ten Commandments as they're listed in the Torah. Now the final similarity at number one in this episode is God is referred to in plural. Now this is a big one. So in the book of Genesis chapter one, it says in the beginning God created and the word for God in the Hebrew is the word Elohim, which is a plural word. Also in the book of Genesis, Genesis chapter 1 verses 26 it says let us make man in our image in our likeness so here we see God speaking in the plural because only God is the creator now some scholars say that it's not that God is speaking in the plural but rather that plural language is used in order to stress the power of God the common Christian belief on the other hand is that this alludes to the Trinity similar language is found in the Quran in surah 50 verses 16 it says and we we have already created man and know what his soul whispers to him and we are closer to him than his jugular vein. One explanation according to Muslim theology is that this also stresses the power of God and does not suggest that there are two gods at all and that when the Arabic text is translated into English, the plural form is used as there is no exact equivalent to the Arabic text. Starting at number 10, there are similarities with the purpose of prayer in each of these religions. So starting with Judaism, prayer builds the relationship between God and human beings. Well, because when people pray, they spend time Time with God and to pray is to serve God with your heart. Instead of the religion of Islam, prayer keeps Muslims in touch with God and keeps Muslims constantly reflecting on their actions and assessing whether or not they're living true. At number nine, we have the command to pray. So praying isn't just an idea that Muslims and Jews just came up like, oh, it's a good idea if I'm in the mood. Rather, it's actually a command and obligatory in both religions. In Judaism, prayer is seen as a service of the heart, and it's a commandment based in the Torah. It's mandatory for both Jewish men and women. And the scripture often used for this is Deuteronomy 11 verse 13, which says, you shall serve God with your whole heart. And now in Islam, the command to pray is found in Surah 30, Arum 17 and 18. Some say that these only mention four prayer times, but the fifth time is said to be found in Hud 11 verse 104, which says, and establish prayer at the two ends of the day and at the approach of the night. Jews and Muslims also pray directly to God. So in prayer, each individual Muslim and Jew has direct contact with God. There's no need for a priest or any other type of intermediary. It's just you and God. Although yes, there are prayer leaders and people of religious authority, but they're not to be viewed as intermediaries at all, but rather they're just people who may have greater knowledge and understanding of the particular faith. You can also find call to prayers in Judaism and Islam as well. In Islam, we have the Azan and that's the call to worship and it's recited in a melodious way. Allah. The purpose behind the Azan is to make an easy summary of the Islamic beliefs really available to everyone as well as a daily reminder for Muslims to pray. The Azen goes as follows. God is the greatest and that's repeated four times. I bear witness that there is no Lord except God and that's repeated twice. I bear witness that Muhammad is a messenger of God and that's repeated twice. Make haste towards prayer, also repeated twice. Make haste towards success, repeated twice. God is the greatest, that's also repeated twice. And the final line is only repeated once and that says there is no Lord except God. Now for Jews, in the past, Jews would use a ram's horn. <laughs> However, nowadays, what is called the Bar Chu is conducted as a part of the Jewish prayer service and it serves as a call to prayer. <laughs> The 
The call to prayer consists of a Jew who is vocally trained called a Chazan and he calls out bless the Lord the blessed one and then the congregation responds and says bless is the Lord the blessed one forever and ever and the Chazan repeats the congregation's part. There's also a similarity with prayer time. So Jews are supposed to pray three times a day, morning, afternoon and evening and praying regularly enables a person to really build a closer relationship with God and Muslims you know they pray five times a day. The Salat is the second of the five pillars of Islam and it's observed at five different times of the day. We have morning, afternoon, late afternoon, evening and night. You'll also find similar prayer positions, standing, sitting, bowing and prostration. Prostration is not as common in Judaism but certain groups like the Ashkenazi Jews they regularly prostrate themselves in prayer. There's also what I call main prayers. So inside of Judaism there's this Shema and it's the most important prayer in Judaism and it's recited often multiple times a day and this reaffirms the Jewish people to their faith of Judaism. And it goes as follows, Hear O Israel, Adonai is our God, Adonai is one. And by the way, Adonai translates to the Lord in English, so you could also say it like this, Hear O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. And in Islam, it's the Shahada, and the Shahada sums up Islam in one single prayer in a faith, recitation of the Shahada is also required for any that wants to convert to the religion and they gotta believe it as well. And it goes as follows, there is no God but Allah and Muhammad is the messenger of Allah. Number three, they share the direction that they face. Well, they don't actually share the direction that they face in prayer, but for Jews, it's customary that they face towards the east. However, they don't actually necessarily have to face the east. They just face the Temple Mount in Jerusalem and depending on your location, it could be in the east. Muslims all around the world, they face the Kaaba in the city of Mecca when they perform their prayers. It also unites Muslims from all around the world in their worship of God, despite their cultural racial differences. And number two, we have washing before prayer. So in Judaism, ritual washing or ablution of full body immersion as well as washing the hands exists. A person should wash their hands before prayer. And the term in Hebrew is netilat yadaim, which is the washing of hands with a cup. Before praying, Muslims Muslims wash their hands, face, head, and feet, and this washing ablution is called wudu. And the purpose is to physically purify yourself, but it also symbolizes spiritual purity as well. And the final similarity I want to share with you is the similarity of public prayers. So Muslims can pray anywhere, but there are added benefits to pray with others in a mosque. Praying together in a congregation helps Muslims to realize that everyone is equal, and it's an opportunity to remain united in the faith. Jews are also invited to go to the synagogue to pray but can pray anywhere also. It really helps to build togetherness within the Jewish community locally and around the world. So Hebrews, Jews, and Israelites, they're the same exact people. So let me break it down for you. Abraham, who's a father of the Jewish people, was called a Hebrew. His grandson Jacob was renamed Israel by God and he had many children who became the people or children of Israel. Now Judah was one of the sons of actual Israel. It was promised that the Messiah or the Savior of the world would come through the tribe of Judah. And as time went on, King David, who descended from the tribe of Judah, he ruled over a large portion of the Israelites and the people adopted the name Jews, which comes from Judah. You may often hear Hebrews and Jews and Israelites being used interchangeably depending on the time and place, but at least now you have a little bit more of an idea of why the different terms are used. And number nine, so there are three main branches in Judaism. There are Reform, Conservative, and Orthodox Jews. Of course, there are some smaller sects of Judaism as well and each of them have their own unique customs and practices but all of them do follow and they understand and interpret what they do as the real authentic version of Judaism but their underlying and core beliefs are all the same since they stemmed from the exact same place. In Judaism there is just one God. Judaism believes that the one God is invisible, he's the creator of heaven and earth and he has no children and he's self-sustaining, all-knowing and all-powerful. All creation depends on God to survive. God does, however, go by several names, which are considered to be so holy that Jews 
only use them in prayer. Jews generally refer to God as Hashem, which means the name in Hebrew. In the Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible, God tells the Jewish people to follow his commandments, and there are 613 of them in total. Now normally people say, oh my god, that's a lot of commandments, that's a lot of rules. But hear this, have you ever looked through all of the law books of your country or even your city? Way more than 613. E either way, these are known as mitzvahs, meaning instructions. For the Jewish people, these laws are life itself. And the path to connect to God rather than just some good recommendations. Now let's talk about Shabbat or the Sabbath. It is something that Jews view as a gift to humanity, not just a gift to the Jewish people. Right after the exodus out of ancient Egypt, God said to take a day off from work. That's part of the mitzvahs. Now there's some debate on what is classified as work, but this day off is known as Shabbat. It's a day dedicated to worship services, a time with friends and family, and to just rest and take a break. This happens weekly and it stems from the belief that God created the world in six days and rested on the seventh day. Not that God was actually tired, but rather God took a break from creating and reflected on what he had accomplished. So Sabbath begins Friday sunset to sunset on Saturday where human beings are invited to do the same thing. Take a break from your work and just reflect on what you've accomplished. And you're also invited to give thanks and praise to God as well. Halfway in, so you have probably heard the term rabbi in relation to Judaism before. Well if not, a rabbi is Hebrew for master or teacher. And a rabbi is someone who is very knowledgeable about Judaism, the scriptures, and they are Jews who guide other Jews in their studies of the scripture and help them to understand the mitzvahs more clearly and things related to service of God. Now check this out. This is the Temple Mount and the Temple Mount is considered sacred for Jews since they believe that God manifested here more than any other place ever. When praying, the Jews turn towards Temple Mount. However, it's forbidden to pray on Temple Mount because it's such a holy site and Jews can only enter to visit at certain limited times. This is the reason why the Western Wall holds so much significance for the Jews today. Another important part about the history of Judaism is that the Jewish people began as slaves. The book of Exodus in the Bible tells how God helped Moses set the Jewish people free from slavery in ancient Egypt. It tells how the Israelites are also the chosen people of God. And in Hebrew, the book of Exodus is known as Shemot, meaning names. It's the second book of the Hebrew Bible and it's believed by most that Moses wrote that book of Exodus. You've also probably heard the term Bar Mitzvah. Well, Bar Mitzvah is the rite of passage into adulthood for a Jewish boy. There's bar mitzvah, that's for the boys, and bat mitzvah, that's for the girls. This is an important tradition in Judaism, and it's mentioned in the Talmud, and it marks the age when a child becomes accountable for their actions as a man or woman. Before the bar mitzvah or the bat mitzvah, the responsibility of the child's actions are all on the parents. This also makes a boy or girl eligible to participate in public worship services, as well as start observing the commandments in a more serious way. The age of bar Bar mitzvah is 13 and the age of the bat mitzvah is age 13 or 12 depending on the branch of Judaism that you follow. And the final thing is the synagogue is a place of Jewish worship and prayer services. It's believed that synagogues came about during the Babylonian captivity in Israel because the Jewish temples were not able to be accessed for worship. Now today a synagogue is in every single Jewish community around the world and some synagogues also have different rooms for studying the Torah among other things. At number 10, all Jews support Israel. In fact, prior to World War II, there was a great controversy about whether or not there should be a Jewish homeland in the Middle East. There was also some controversy about what kind of homeland it should be. Some wanted to establish a Jewish cultural center within the Ottoman Empire. Others wanted a nation and state for the Jewish people and have a lot of political power involved in it. But today, many years after the establishment of the state of Israel, most Jews want to see a democratic Israel with secure boundaries and a place of peace, especially amongst their neighbors. Also, at the same time, many Jews disagree with the policies of the Israeli government. Rabbis are ministers. Well, not necessarily. Rabbis are expert in Jewish law 
And until recently, it was quite rare for a synagogue to have a rabbi unless they needed to have someone make decisions about Jewish law. And on a whole, a synagogue needed a chazen or a cantor who could sing throughout the services. Now, many synagogues in Jewish communities operate without a rabbi. And usually you'll find rabbis among the reform and liberal Jews, but not necessarily all Jewish groups. For number eight, let's look at kosher laws. Jews keep kosher laws because it's healthier? Hmm. Well, Jews actually keep kosher for one of two reasons. They are fulfilling the commandments in the Torah or they are doing this for reasons of cultural identity. There are actually no specific health reasons for keeping kosher, although some health benefits may possibly be achieved. Popular Jewish teaching is that these commandments were given to Moses and Israel to distinguish them from other people around the world so that their eating could become a witness to the presence of God in the world. Number seven, Hanukkah is equivalent to Christmas. Well, no, it is not. It is not the Jewish version of Christmas. It is true that some Jews try to make Hanukkah a substitute for Christmas so that their children don't feel left out. But in actuality, it's a minor and not a major festival. The festival of Hanukkah really only happens in the evening when the candles are lit. Generally, stories of the Maccabees and stories of Judith are told. While the books of the Maccabees and the book of Judith aren't in the Jewish Bible, their stories are still seen as important. Number six, let's talk about the Passover Sedar. A common misunderstanding about Judaism is that going to the Sedar represents the Last Supper. Although the Gospels in the Bible put the Last Supper with Jesus and his disciples around the time of Passover and therefore Sedar, there is no conclusive evidence that the Last Supper was a Jewish ritual known as a Sedar. Most scholars say that the Last Supper was most likely an ordinary Jewish meal, and it is also said that the Sedar began to be practiced sometime after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 CE, after the time of Jesus. For lie number five, Jews have horns. Now, this is not so much a modern misconception, but it was a huge misconception in the past. In the Middle Ages, a widespread misunderstanding about a verse from the Torah resulted in false stereotypes and even murder of Jewish people. The myth came about through a Latin mistranslation of Exodus 34 verses 35 that says, And the children of Israel saw Moses' face, that his skin became Karen, and Moses put a veil back upon his face until he went in to speak with God. Now, the Hebrew term Karen, which means radiance, was mistranslated by by St. Jerome as Karen, meaning horn in Hebrew, and this led to artistic portrayals of Jews as devilish characters. Artists like Michelangelo even depicted a horned Moses, and the statue that Michelangelo created is actually in the chamber of the U.S. House of Representatives today. Judaism prohibits birth control? Well, you'll find many large Jewish families, that's for sure. However, in Judaism, the actual biblical obligation to be fruitful and multiply found in the Torah, in the book of Genesis chapter 1 verses 28 and also chapter 9 verses 7 is fulfilled by having simply two children, a boy and a girl. So to say that a religious couple is not allowed to use birth control would be a big misconception pun intended. Orthodox Jewish couples generally consult a rabbi to evaluate whether or not they can use birth control and which methods are preferable. So yeah, it's really up to the couple and it's not something that Judaism outright prohibits. Number three, Jesus and his bar mitzvah. Let's look at this one. Regardless of whether or not someone believes that Jesus existed, there were actually no bar mitzvahs until the 10th century, which is a thousand years after the time of Jesus. And apparently bar mitzvahs actually started to appear at about the same time as the separation of men and women in the synagogue. Up until that time, they sat together. Lie number two, Jews follow Judaism. This is a huge one. Jews are an ethnic group as well as a religious group. Hence, you might identify yourself as Jewish, but not religious. But you couldn't be considered religious Jewish unless you were ethnically Jewish or had become Jewish. The issue of Jewish identity has its intricacies for sure. 
Usually a person is considered Jewish if their mother is Jewish. Certain groups, however, accept that a person is Jewish if they have one Jewish parent and are also brought up as Jewish. And finally, we made it to number one, the biggest lie in this episode. All Judaism is found in the Old Testament. You can find stories related to Judaism and see the Ten Commandments and things like that. But biblical Judaism with the tabernacle and the temple and priestly services, animal sacrifices, all of that, is not the Judaism practice today. Judaism is a religion that is living and developing and has evolved to meet the times that we live in. There's also, of course, much debate around how much Judaism should change without deviating from its origins. But either way, all of what Judaism today is cannot be found in the Old Testament. All right, let's jump into this. At number 10, we have the Daibucks. A Daibuck is a disembodied evil spirit that, due to its sins when it was alive, it wanders aimlessly until it finds a body of a living person. And when it finds a body, that's when it possesses the new body's soul and it creates a separate personality inside that person and causes a whole lot of mental illness. Now, people with nervous disorders were taken to a rabbi who believed he could actually cast out the daibuk through an exorcism. Number nine brings us Asmodeus. According to Zoroastrian and Jewish legend, Asmodeus is the prince of demons and he appears in the book of Tobit, one of the ancient Jewish religious books where he torments a woman named Sarah. Now let's just hold on for a minute, guys. I'm just thinking, why is it that when it comes to horror movies and scary stories, there's always a Sarah getting tormented or killed? <sighs> Should I be worried though? My wife is named Sarah. Okay, Asmodeus. If you're watching this, back up, back up. I'm warning you. Don't mess with me. As the legend goes, Sarah was married to seven men in succession and Asmodeus slays each husband on their wedding night. Sarah's eighth husband, Tobias, ends up outsmarting Asmodeus on his wedding night and he enjoyed a long marriage with her. Moving on to number eight, we have Golem. The myth of the Golem originates in the idea that human beings might be able to form living creatures from clay, just like Adam was formed from clay by God. The most famous golem is the one made by Jewish mystic and philosopher Rabbi Judah Leo, who was the Maharal of Prague, who inscribed a clay man with the word emet, meaning truth, and then he spoke the divine name and brought him to life. The golem protected the Jewish community from persecution, but ended up becoming too difficult to control. It became very dangerous, so the rabbi just decided to erase the first letter of the word emet, leaving the word met, which means dead. Number seven brings us Leviathan. Now, Leviathan is this massive sea creature, and the Leviathan is referenced throughout the Hebrew Bible, and according to tradition, it was created by God at the beginning of time. Now, Leviathan has a counterpart, which is a land creature, and that creature is known as Behemoth, and in some versions of the legend, Leviathan is the female mate of Behemoth. Leviathan is often an embodiment of chaos and it threatens to eat those who are damned. There's also a Jewish legend that says that in the Messianic era, the Leviathan will be killed and the righteous people will end up eating its flesh. Number six brings us to the fiery flying serpent. The fiery flying serpent is mentioned by the prophet Isaiah in the Bible, and the term translated as fiery servant, seraph, appears in the book of Isaiah to signify the seraphim, and the singular of seraphim is seraph. Isaiah also sees them in a vision, each of them having six wings, and they flew in the presence of God. But the term fiery serpent in other contexts is also mentioned. In the book of Numbers, the Israelites, they start to complain about not having enough food and water, so God sends fiery serpents to attack them. But the Israelites, they end up begging for forgiveness, so God tells Moses to put a copper serpent figure on top of a rod, and anyone that looks on the rod, they will recover. So we see that the full scope of the fiery serpent's abilities is shrouded in mystery, making it all the more scary. Halfway in at number five, we have Mazakin. The Mazakin are invisible demons that pester individuals. Mazakin, they are lower level demons though, and they're actually 
types of demons that you can encounter in your daily life. They don't necessarily do much harm because they rarely possess people, but they tend to only attack if they are angry or they're just generally unhappy. Rather than try to get rid of them, they say the best thing to do is just learn to live with them. Either way, if it makes itself visible, yeah, that's definitely going to send some chills up your spine. The being at number four is the Nephilim. According to one interpretation of the book of Genesis chapter 6 in the Hebrew Bible, in the early generations of humanity, there were some divine beings that became very attracted to human women that they came down and they ended up mating with them. And then the offspring that they produced are known as the Nephilim. These semi-divine giants, they roamed the earth for generations and they tormented people. But what happened to them after that? Well, nobody knows for sure. The being at number three is the Shamir. The Shamir is a supernatural being with power to cut through stone, iron, and diamond. It's mentioned throughout the Talmud and the Shamir was created right before the first Shabbat or Sabbath, just as God finished creation. It's said that Moses used it to engrave gemstones in the high priest's breastplate and King Solomon also commissioned a search to find one for the use in the construction of the temple. And the Shamir is said to have lost its powers though at the first temple's destruction. The scary being at number two is Lilith. In Jewish lore, Lilith is a female demonic figure and was actually the first woman ever created before Eve. She was feared because she was believed to slay women in childbirth and steal their babies. She was also known for her uncontrollable sexuality. She would force men to sleep with her. And she did this just so that she can get pregnant and give birth to produce more demonic offsprings. The creature we're going to end off at number one is the estries. Estries are a type of vampiric being who also take on a female form. Mentioned in Sefer Hasidim, Estries preyed on Jewish citizens and had to drink blood to stay alive. Estries could also fly if their hair was unbound, but binding their hair would stop them from flying. And these beings are very hard to get rid of. It is believed that burying them isn't enough to get rid of them. No, you needed to pack its mouth with dirt and then bury it, or you could also decapitate it or burn it. Starting at number 10, we have Elohim. Angels within the Elohim are known for their commitment to victory of good over evil. And there's one famous archangel, Haniel, who leads Elohim according to Kabbalah, which again is a mystical branch of Judaism. Now it may come as a surprise since Elohim is a name used for God according to the Hebrew Bible, but the term can also be translated as angels based on the context. Number nine brings us the Opanim. Members of the Opanim rank of angels never, never, ever sleep because they're constantly busy guarding God's throne up in heaven. And they're also known for their wisdom. Their name comes from the Hebrew word Ophan, which means wheel. And this is due to their description inside of the Hebrew Bible, specifically in the book of Ezekiel, especially in the first chapter, because they're described as spirits that have their spirits encased in a wheel that move along with them. So when they move, the wheel moves with them. Now in Kabbalah, the famous archangel Raziel leads the Ophanim. The next type of angel we're gonna look at at number eight is the Erelim. Now these angels are known for their courage and understanding. The famous archangel Safikiel, he leads the Erelim in Kabbalah. Safikiel, now that's a pretty interesting word, even the spelling of it. Well, that word there means knowledge of God. And the archangel Zakiel is known as the angel of understanding and compassion. Next up at number seven, we're looking at the Hashmalim. Now the Hashmalim are known for their love as well as their grace and their kindness. And the archangel Zadkiel, a very popular archangel in Judaism, he leads this rank of angels according to Kabbalah. Zadkiel is thought to be the angel of the Lord as described throughout the Old Testament of the Bible, who shows a lot of mercy and kindness, especially in Genesis chapter 22 of the Torah when the prophet Abraham is preparing to sacrifice his son Isaac. Next, I wanna look at the Malachim. 
Members of the Malakim rank of angels are known for their beauty and mercy. Now in Kabbalah, their famous archangel Raphael leads this class of angels. Throughout this video, you might start recognizing certain names for angels, whether it's from the Protestant Christian belief or Catholicism. Either way, we just saw five angels in the religion of Judaism. Hope you enjoyed this episode so far. If you are, don't forget to leave a like on this video. And if this is your first time here to FTD Facts, hit that subscribe button because we post videos every single week like this. We talk about the different religions, countries, cultures, and people, and more from all around our world. So if you're interested in any of those topics, stick around here on FTD Facts to keep on learning with us. Getting back into the list, at number five, we have the Beni Elohim. The Beni Elohim, they focus a lot of their work on giving God all of the glory, all of the praise. Now in Kabbalah, it says that the famous archangel Michael leads this rank of angels. Michael is mentioned in major religious texts more than any other named angel, and he's often shown as a warrior who fights for what's right to bring glory to God. As a matter of fact, when you break down the name Michael in Hebrew, Mikael, that means one who is like God. And in some translations, it translates to who is like God in a question format. Now, in the book of Daniel chapter 12 in the Hebrew Bible, it describes Michael as being the great prince who will protect God's people even during the struggles between good and evil at the end of time. The Ashim come next at number four. Now, the Ashim is a rank of angels that is the closest to human beings. The Ashim focus on building God's kingdom here on earth. Now in the Kabbalah faith, their leader is the archangel Sandalphon. And not only are these angels closely associated with human beings, but their class is also the closest level to the human beings in terms of power and wisdom and abilities. Seraphim coming at number three. I'm sure you guys have probably have heard of this one before. Seraphim angels are known for their work for justice. Now the Kabbalah says that the famous archangel Chamuel leads the Seraphim rank. Now the Hebrew Bible records a vision of the prophet Isaiah that had Seraphim angels near to God in heaven. And the passage says, above him were six seraphim, each with six wings. With two wings, they covered their face. With two wings, they covered their feet. And with two wings, they were flying. And they were calling to one another, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The whole earth is full of his glory. And you can find that from the book of Isaiah, chapter six, verses two to three. Next up at number two, a very popular angelic rank, cherubim, not just in Christianity or Judaism, but also in other various New Age beliefs as well. The cherubim angels are known for their work helping people with the sin that separates them from God so that they can draw closer to God. Now, the archangel Gabriel leads the cherubim according to Kabbalah. Gabriel is mentioned numerous times in Christianity as well as in the religion of Islam. But in Judaism though, the cherubim angels first appear in the Torah and they pop up right after humans brought sin into the world while they were in the Garden of Eden. And the passage in the book of Genesis goes as follows. After he, God, drove the man out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way of the tree of life. And you can find that in the book of Genesis chapter 3 verses 24. The Chayot HaKodesh comes in at number one. Now the first and the highest type of angels is called the Chayot HaKodesh. Now they are known for their enlightenment as well as they're responsible for holding up God's throne and also for holding earth in its proper position in outer space. The Chayot HaKodesh, they really emanate a very powerful light and they often appear like they're covered up in fire. The famous archangel Metatron leads the Chayot HaKodesh. Not to be confused, by the way, with Megatron from Transformers. Maybe that's where they got the name from, thinking about it now. But either way, that belief is most commonly taught in the mystical branch of Judaism known as Kabbalah. For the story at number 10, we have God shows Moses his back. And this is found in the book of Exodus, chapter 33, verses 18 to 23. God and prophet Moses, they are known to have direct communication throughout many of the early sections of the Jewish Bible. Moses asks God to reveal his glory, but God warns that anyone who views his divine face will 
pass away. So God covers Moses' face with his hands and passes by and only shows Moses his back. The story at number 9 involves the sun and the moon standing still, and this is taken from the book of Joshua chapter 10 verses 12 to 14. God responds to our prayer by making the sun and moon just completely stop so that Joshua could continue a major battle during daytime. Now to quote some of the passage, it goes as follows. So the sun stood still in the midst of heaven and did not hasten to go down for about a whole day. And there has been no day like that before it and after it that the Lord heeded the voice of a man for the Lord fought for Israel. The story at number eight involves a talking donkey. We find this in the book of Numbers 22 verses 21 to 34. A man by the name of Balaam was summoned by a king to go and curse his enemies, but God sent an angel to block the road. Only Balaam's donkey was able to see the angel and he got scared. So it tries to avoid the angel and Balaam's foot gets crushed on some walls beside them because they were riding through a narrow path at the time. And the angel doesn't leave, so the donkey lies down. It's not moving, it's really scared. And Balaam gets frustrated. He starts beating the donkey a total of three times. And then the donkey starts to speak to him and says, am I not your own donkey, which you have always ridden? Have I been in the habit of doing this to you? And Balaam responds, he says, no. And finally, he's able to see the angel himself and realizes that going and cursing his enemies is not a good idea at all. The story number seven involves a Babylonian king, Nebuchadnezzar, who ends up eating grass. And this story can be found in the book of Daniel chapter four. It concludes in verses 33. King Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon and he viewed himself as all powerful. So God decided to put Nebuchadnezzar in his place by making him think that he was a cow. Yeah, a beast of the field. So Nebuchadnezzar, he goes mad. He starts to go out into the fields. He's eating grass. His hair is growing out. His nails are growing out. And this lasts for seven years. And after seven years, he finally regains his sanity and he's humble out of this whole process. So he ends up worshiping God in the end. Pillar of Salt comes in at number six. Now it concludes in Genesis chapter 19 verses 26. But leading up to that passage, we read a story where God has reached his limit of mercy with the two cities of Sodom and Gomorrah, and he's sending judgment on those cities. Now Lot, who's the nephew of the great prophet Abraham, is warned by angels to flee to safety with his family. As Lot and his family are leaving, they are warned to not look back at all. Just keep on going, don't look back. Unfortunately though, his wife looks back and she instantly becomes a pillar of salt. Halfway in the story at number five is found in the book of 1 Kings chapter 20 verses 35 to 38. Now there was a prophet who was planning to disguise himself as a wounded person and he had asked someone who was accompanying him to strike him and wound him with his weapon but the companion refused to do so. So the prophet who was speaking on behalf of God looked at his companion and said that since he refused to obey the word of the Lord well, a lion is going to come and eat him. And that's what happens when the prophet leaves. Now, the prophet found another person and asked him to do the exact same thing. Strike him and wound him with his weapon. And that person ends up listening and his life is spared. Story number four is found in the book of 2 Kings chapter 2 verses 23 to 24. Elisha, who is the successor of the prophet Elijah, was walking along the road to Bethel when a group of 42 young boys ran up to him and, you know, as kids do, they started to taunt him because he had a bald head and they were saying things like, get out of here, baldy. So he looked at the boys, he cursed them in the name of the Lord and two bears came out of the woods and ate those children just like that. And Elisha continues on his way. Snakes on a staff come in next at number three. And this is found in the book of Numbers 21 verses five to seven. So the people of ancient Israel, they began 
to get discouraged and their unbelief was kicking in. They started to complain against Moses for bringing them into the wilderness and they were blaming God for abandoning them. And because of this, they tried to put all the blame on Moses. And as a punishment against the people, God sent some poisonous serpents into their midst and they tormented the people and some people even lost their lives. Now, Moses, he had sympathy and he was praying to God for God to relieve the people of this and God told him to make a bronze serpent and put it on a staff so that when people looked at it they were healed and that's what happened. The story number two is a pretty sad one. It's found in the book of Judges chapter 11 verses 29 to 40. When a man of God named Jephthah was in battle he promised that he would sacrifice to God whatever comes out to greet him when he returns back home. And of course he was thinking that this would be an animal or something because animals do that when they see their owners come back, they run out, they bark if it's a dog or whatever. But unfortunately in his case it turned out to be his daughter who first greeted him. And he voiced his grief and sorrow at the thought of losing his daughter. But his daughter has a surprising reply. She says, well you made a promise to the Lord so you gotta do what you gotta do. She does ask, however, for an extension of life for two months to be exact, but at the end of those two months, she is sacrificed by her father. Now, finally, we end off with a pretty dark one, at number one. It's found in the book of Judges, chapter 19, verses 22 to 30. A man was traveling with his concubine or mistress and is invited as a guest in another man's home. But there was a gang of men in the town that saw this man enter and they were really attracted to him. So they started to bang on the door that the man was a guest in and ask for him to be sent out. So the owner of the house begs the men outside to stop banging on the door and leave his male guest alone. But they persist and the man offers his own daughter to them, also his guest's concubine he offers for the men outside but the gang of men they still keep on begging for the male guest so they end up pushing out the male guest's concubine outside of the house to satisfy the gang of men now the gang of men they do all sorts of indescribably horrible things to her all night until morning and when the male guest finds her in the morning She's on the ground in front of the home. She's passed away. He takes her home on his donkey and then he proceeds to chop her body up into 12 pieces, which he sends to the various different parts of ancient Israel to show people how evil they have become.